In my House of Black and White Part 3, I talked about how you might go about becoming a servant of the Many-Faced God and then moving up through their order. This video, I wanted to talk specifically about Arya's personal journey through the House of Black and White, starting when she first gets to Bravos in A Feast for Crows. And I really wanted to make this video because just like with my part 3 where I tried to piece together how one becomes a servant of the many-faced god based on Arya's chapters, I feel by all of us looking at Arya's journey together, laid out in one video, we can start coming up with our own thoughts on the Order. Which always leads to some fun theories. Arya appears to first gain Passage 2 and the ability to stay at the House of Black and White when she presents the iron coin Jack and Hagar gave her to the priest of the temple. But that coin only permits entry, not the ability to stay. Arya has to earn that. Her first test is given right away. She had to prove she, on some level, isn't afraid of death. We can assume if she failed, she would have been told to leave the temple. You most likely don't get a second chance. So for this first test, she is asked if she fears death, and our feisty Arya responds no. Then a priest, the kindly man, lowers his cowl to reveal he has no face but a yellowed skull with scraps of skin clinging to its cheeks and a white worm wriggling from one empty eye socket. The man asks Arya to kiss him. Arya meets the challenge, kissing him where his nose should be and plucking the grave worm from his eye and attempting to eat it. The worm melts like a shadow from her hand before she can do so. The kindly old man appears normal again and smiles down at her. He says, No one has ever tried to eat my worm before. Passing the test, the priest then asks Arya if she's hungry and she is allowed to remain in the temple. For now. Arya is then given her own cell on the second level with the other servants. She is also given servants' clothing. A tunic of undyed wool, baggy pants, linen small clothes, and cloth slippers for her feet. Her mattress is stuffed with rags, but she is told she can have as many blankets as she wants. Once being given her room, she is required to work. These tasks range from helping in the kitchen, to sweeping the floors, serving and pouring meals, sorting piles of dead men's clothing, and emptying their purse and stacking coins. Every morning she is required to walk beside the kindly man to travel around the temple to find dead bodies. At each alcove, she would open a shutter on her lantern, just a crack, to look for corpses. During this time, Arya would note that the others in the temple all have their own assignments, such as a blind acolyte who is in charge of the candles. But just working while staying at the temple isn't enough for her to remain there. Arya is questioned, as all potential servants likely are. Why are you here? At first, Arya answers this incorrectly. She has a kill list and wants those people on it dead. This makes the kindly man worry that Arya has just come to learn how to kill men she hates, which is a huge problem because the servants of this god do not decide who should live or die. He tells Arya if her goal is to learn how to kill the men she hates, this isn't the place for her. Arya responds, oh, but continues to stay at the temple. Arya is also asked daily, who are you? and she would respond, no one, even though the priests never believed her. Soon, her day-to-day -day life at the temple becomes a routine. Every morning, she prays at dawn with the other servants, kneeling around the fountain before breaking their fast. The prayers were always led by one of the priests at the temple. Then she would go about her tasks. Besides working, it appears Arya is given quite a bit of freedom in the temple. After her work is done for the day, she's allowed to wander the temple amongst the vaults and storerooms so long as she doesn't descend to the third level, the Holy Sanctum, where only priests can go, or as long as she doesn't leave the temple. Not leaving the temple is so important that she's told that if she ever leaves without permission, she may never come back. At night, supper would ensure Arya went to bed with a full stomach, and it is during these times she is allowed to ask the kindly man questions, such as why do people who come to the temple always seem so peaceful? Where she's from, death is a scary thing, and people never seem at peace with it. Despite serving and falling into this routine, during this time of being a servant and helping with various jobs, 
Arya is not considered one of them. The kindly man lets her know that, and numerous times he gives her the option to leave, no questions asked. He even allows her to request a type of arrangement upon leaving, marriage with a rich old man or anyone she desires, working as a whore, or even passage back to anywhere in Westeros. It's unknown if any potential member of the House of Black and White is given as many outs as Arya is given, or if the kindly man feels that she might not be the best recruit or she's not at the point in her life where she would make a good one. At this time, he's very insistent in reminding her that the House of Black and White is not a home for orphans and that all men serve in this temple and that obedience is required in all things and at all times. An inability to obey means she must depart. During this time, the kindly man also explains this obedience to her. It includes shedding your identity and pledging your whole self to the many-faced god. But this is something Arya struggles with, and the kindly man can tell. This struggle is apparent when she is required to rid herself of her belongings to help her along in becoming no one. Though she does eventually throw her belongings into the sea, except for her sword needle, which she hides. After some time as a servant and after getting rid of her belongings, the kindly man finally shares the origin of their religion. After this, the kindly man sends her to the other priests in the temple to learn the tongue of Bravos and then to learn to tell and spot lies. It's during this time when we learn that knowing bravosi and learning to tell and detect lies is another requirement to serve. When Arya agrees to learn the tongue of bravos with the other priest, she is officially a novice in the House of Black and White and given a black and white robe to wear along with fine white linen small clothes and a black under tunic. Once becoming a novice, she spends much of her time with the other priests learning bravosi and how to tell and detect lies. She would also serve refreshments to the faceless men who came to the House of Black and White from time to time to discuss kill contracts, though she is warned to never engage with them. Next, Arya is taught to master her face, something that will help her lie. She is told to practice an hour every day mastering different parts of her face. Shortly after she begins these practices, Arya is also told to help the other acolytes prepare corpses. Months would go by of Arya washing corpses, learning the bravosi tongue, trying to remember to be no one, and making faces in the mirror. Finally, the kindly man sends her out on an assignment in Bravos, believing she will be able to master their tongue if she is required to speak it from dawn to dusk. Out in the city, she worked for a man selling cockles, clams, and mussels under a fake identity, Cat. Every new moon, she would return to the House of Black and White for three days and tell the kindly man three new things she learned while gone. During her three-day stay, she continued serving in the temple, washing bodies, helping in the kitchen, checking the dead, helping one of the priests prepare potions, and being taught about poisons. After the three days were up, she would return to her job in Bravos until the next new moon. Interestingly, after she's sent out on this assignment, her training becomes a bit more aggressive. When she returns to the temple for three days out of every 30, Arya is slapped every time she shows mannerisms consistent with herself, such as biting her lip. She is told no one should not have the behavioral patterns of Arya Stark. One day while out in the city, Arya kills a deserter of the Night's Watch. When she returns to the temple, she is punished by being blinded. Though later we find out she would have been blinded eventually to help her learn to use her other senses. But typically it happens much later in training, at least after being at the temple for six months. Through the kindly man's confession, it almost seems like Arya is being rewarded and her training accelerated. Of course, this could also be a way of them trying to get her to take it more seriously and show more obedience. After becoming blinded, Arya takes on the name Blind Beth and every morning the kindly man would ask her if she wanted her eyes back today. Arya always gave the same answer with an expressionless face. I may want them on the morrow, not today. She knows that if she asks for her eyes back, they will send her away. As Blind Beth, Arya is sent out into the city to beg at different spots. To disguise her as Beth, they shaved her head, gave her pox scars, and a mummer's mole on one cheek, with dark hair growing from it. Despite this new assignment of begging as a blind girl, she is still required to learn three new things and tell them to the kindly man on her return to the temple. Even blinded, the priests continue to tell her lies to test her, and Arya was taught to count on her other senses, such as using her sense of touch, sense of smell, or counting to find her way around the temple. During her three days out of the month at the temple, in the afternoons, she learned about poisons and potions, something a bit dangerous as using touch and taste can be perilous when grinding poisons, but she serves nevertheless. 
At supper, she was now required to learn other languages, including High Valerian and the tongues of Lys and Pentos. In the evening, the lying game also continued. This becomes much harder as instead of facial clues, she must now discern lies from choice of words or tone, though at times Arya is allowed to rest her hands on the face of the person talking. Her blindness also limited her in other tasks, such as when working in the kitchen, she burned or cut herself over and over, or when searching the alcoves for dead bodies, the temple was treacherous, and she began to learn to find the corpses by smell. When found, she would clean their bodies and sort their possessions. Through doing this, she soon learned to sort the coins by touch. Eventually, Arya is able to feel the currents on her skin, find the kitchen, and identify people by smells, and learn the patterns of individuals' footsteps. She would also begin to be surprised attacked by an unknown assailant in the temple. This unknown attacker would ridicule her as she was forced to defend herself. When she is finally able to identify her attacker, the kindly man, she is rewarded by being given her eyes back. Whether he knows she used her warg ability, looking through the eyes of a cat to figure it out, is unknown, but he probably didn't. After being given her eyes back, Arya continued her duties at the House of Black and White, including serving the faceless men when they came in to decide kill contracts. After serving at one meeting, Arya talks with a faceless man marked by the plague. This conversation seemed to be yet another way to test Arya's resolve at joining their organization. He questions who she is and tells her she lies when she answers no one. During this conversation, the man scolds Arya that the gift of the many-faced god is not a child's plaything and that she kills for her own purposes of pleasure. He continued to verbally beat her down, telling her she is a small creature. Her heart is too soft to be one of them, and she should push her barrow, cry cockles, and be content. He finally asks Arya if she can pay the price, being all of her, and she says yes, and to give her a face. He responds a face must be earned, and gives her an assignment to kill a man. Returning as Cat of the Canals, she sells her clams, cockles, and mussels, and eyes the man she must kill, observing his appearance and behavior. After watching him for days, she finally announces she's ready to kill him to the kindly man. The kindly man takes her for the first time to the third level, the Holy Sanctum, and into a room where a thousand faces are kept. Arya is given a new face though still not taught herself how to put it on. This is a frightening experience, but the priest talks her through it. The next day, she takes to the streets of Bravos to kill her mark. Arya successfully poisons her target and returns to the House of Black and White. When she returns to the temple, the kindly man tells her she has much and more to learn, but she isn't hopeless. He gives her her face back and gives her the robe of an acolyte. He sends her out on her first apprenticeship. We are still waiting on the next book to see what other training Arya receives on her way to possibly becoming a faceless man. I hope that means there will be a part two to this video. Make sure you hit the like button to help the channel, dislikes help too, but likes just feel warmer. Check out my other parts of this series to learn more about the House of Black and White. Some more North videos will be released soon. Thank you so much for watching and have a great week.